for yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. I'm Mike, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I like what I heard before the meeting. Try and stick to your problems with uh, related to alcohol. That's a little difficult for me to do. I can start uh, talking about my problems related to alcoholism versus alcohol. Which is nothing like I thought I had when I as when I came into AA, and I just I don't uh, I've been around for a while. Maybe I'll give the dates. I guess I should. Uh, 1973, I came in my first meeting. Imagine how long ago that is. And I uh, continued to drink for 12 years, off and on. I have to say off and on. What, what, what difference does that make? I'd go for three or four months and uh, go out on a binge, 12 years. 1985, I was gifted with the, the grace of God. I no longer had this terrible compulsion to drink. The compulsion to drink during those 12 years was more than I could, uh, I, I couldn't not drink. That was what was on my mind. I might, Maybe I was believing wrong, but uh, I, I tried. I would go a little bit for days. And, uh, and then now I haven't, uh, something like 39 years, I haven't. Uh, so a lot of things have changed inside of me. A lot of things have changed outside of me. I'll talk about the things that changed inside of me. The uh, the drinking was a freedom for me to get away from the way I felt when I wasn't drinking. I felt terrible when I wasn't drinking, and it would gradually get worse. I didn't really know I felt terrible. I didn't analyze how other people thought. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave me, leave us. I didn't know I had fear of people. How the hell would I know that? I had everything going for me. So I had to pretend that everything was okay. Geez, that's tired. It's tough. I could drink and then I didn't have to pretend anymore. What a relief. It was easy for me to justify my actions before I came to AA and during those uh, 12 years of, I don't want to call it slipping, but I'll call it slipping, relapses, whatever the hell it is. It was easy for me to justify that. The only thing that would delay or I would try not to drink was because of what it would do to me. It would make me feel terrible. I knew that. But I had no love. There was nothing that would stop me from drinking because of how it would harm people that loved me. Because I didn't love them. The reason I didn't love them is because I had no love. I didn't know that. How the hell did I know that? I know that now because I have love now. I don't have any compulsion to drink, a desire to drink, a longing to drink, feel like drinking for 39 years. 
It would be very difficult for me to drink now because I, uh, I'd have trouble justifying it. Even if I felt like it, I'd have a hell of a job justifying it. What it's going to do to other people. I have a wife now. I have a little, uh, I have a 13-year-old uh, stepdaughter. And I have other things. And it would be terrible for them. But I don't even, I haven't got there yet because I don't feel like drinking. And God willing, I'll never have to use that as a reason not to drink. I don't think I'll give much of a drink a log. It's not that important. It's a lot of love was thrown my way. I'm an only child. My father died when I was six. That could have been, I'm not a psychologist, I don't want to sound like I'm deep, but that could have been the time when I stopped loving. Could have been. I had a lot of respect for my mother. But it didn't bother me to hurt her. Because she loved me dearly. I don't know, only she put me through uh, university. She was left with no money. Fantastic woman, probably the finest woman I've ever met. I hope you hear me, Ma. Because I never said that when I was, when she was alive. I would do anything to spend one day with my mother. And all I wanted to do was get away from her. She just threw love at me. She ran a boarding house to make money. for me to give me an education so I wouldn't be out on the streets. Just an example of what I had to live with. Everyone in that boarding house loved her. You couldn't help but love her. They were all mainly college kids with no money. She looked after them like they were her sons. She didn't want to have women, ladies. She was too smart for that. She knew the conflicts and all the shit that would go on. I tried to convince her to, uh, to get ladies in there so I could have some fun. She's too smart for that. She would interview someone and they... Uh, we really needed someone to rent a room, to have the room rented to, uh, so we could eat. I suppose that was what I thought, I believed. She would sit down with that person and say, uh, yeah, three minutes, four minutes. Took about five minutes. She'd say, sorry, the room's rented. I'd say, Mom, well, what are you doing? Uh, we need someone to rent. I don't want him in my house. He lied to me. Oh, how do you know that? I, I don't know. It's called intuition. She had a guy there, Fred Wiegand, I'll never forget him. He's a big guy. He was going to uh, university to become a doctor, surgeon. One day he said to me, Mike, or Michael, he called me, if you talk to your mother like that again, I'm going to hit you. That was great. That's the way I treated my mother. The boarders used to check out, put up with her, defend her from her son. Terrible, eh? I'm ashamed of that. I'm not like that anymore, thank God. 
one day he, uh, I was working in this Fred. I was reading the paper and he, in the paper it said, uh, Fred Weekend, Dr. Fred Weekend. Nominated or appointed top surgeon in the Montreal General Hospital. It's the guy that stayed at our house, my mother's house. And I, uh, I got an urge to phone him and I phoned him and I got him on the phone. And he said, oh, Mike, Mike Furlong, I, I remember you. How's your mother? I said, she's fine. She's getting older now. He said, you know, Michael, the best years of my life was when I stayed at your mother's. That's what I had to put up with. How the hell did I end up to be such a rotten bastard? Fear. I was full of fear. What's important, how did I end up being a loving person that I am today? That's what I want to think about. I got married, I was uh, 26 years old. I was working, I saw this lady that used to, this girl, lady, whatever, was walking. Very beautiful. I was attracted to that, that type of woman. She was an Italian, I'm Irish Catholic. They used to tell us when we got married and had a kid, Christ, that poor kid, Irish Catholic and Italian, and she was involved, her family was involved in uh, uh, illegal activity, which didn't really matter. But they loved me. They loved me because I was going to give this woman a decent life. An Irish Catholic with a college degree and a loving mother. What else could they ask for? I just wanted someone that I could have. As I was told, you just want a woman for, as a toy, Mike. Someone you could come home to when you felt like coming home. Someone you could go out and show off when you wanted to go out and show off. She wanted to be a mother. She wanted to be a wife. She wanted to be a, father, a mother and a wife and a good person. So we didn't have the same motives, obviously. So it didn't... Uh, because of her background, she could put up with me for a while, 12 years. She was also a very loving person. I had two children with her. I look back and I think she probably could have put up with my drinking. That's how decent she was but she couldn't put up with my extracurricular activities. I ended up going to AA and I'll say the chances of that happening were very remote. I remember a Friday afternoon in 1973, I guess I went alone. I was a, uh, I had the knack when I worked for big corporations that uh, I could pretend that I was interested. And back then, it's not like today. They seemed to like you if you, they thought you were a nice guy. And I think a lot of the people drank too. They maybe not as much as me. Anyway, they put up with me. 
They gave me raises. They gave me promotions. Can you imagine that? And I never did a day's work. May have done half a day. This particular day, I had a terrible hangover, which I often did. And I left around 11 in the morning, and I went to a bar. Which I didn't want anyone to see me, of course. I knew all these things. I would do these things. I was shaking so much. I wanted to get in there before the lunch hour people came. I knew all these things. It was a habit of mine, and uh, I walked in. There was no one in the bar. It was a hiding, hidden little bar. Bars were everywhere in Montreal in those days. And uh, as I expected, no one was there. I sat at the bar, and there was a guy, one guy sitting about two or three stools over. And I didn't really want to look at him. He didn't seem to want to look at me, and it didn't matter. And I sat there, and I started feeling better and better and better. And the drink, and the, uh, the lunch crowd came, and the lunch crowd left. I was there, and he was there. I don't know who spoke to who first. It turned out I knew him. We used to play hockey together as kids. He was going to AA and he was on a slip. We continued drinking and around midnight, I think I came back to the table where we were sitting and I couldn't find the table and I was drunk and he was drunk, I guess. And he said those famous words, Mike, did you ever feel like quitting drinking? I said, yeah, yeah, I think of that often. He said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going back to AA. Soon, would you come with me? Sure, I'll come with you. We continued drinking, that's all he said, and he phoned me that uh, in a day or two or three, I used to get notes. Donnie phoned. Finally, he got me and he said, Mike, I'm coming to get you. You're coming to AA. That's how I got to AA in 1973. He picked me up. We were driving there, and I said, uh, it was around Christmas, I remember. And I said, where the hell are we going? I thought this was just a gimmick to get out and drink or party or some damn thing. And he said, we're going to AA. I said, well, what, what's that all about? He said, you don't drink, Mike. You stop drinking. I said, you stop forever, for good, for never, you never drink again. That's it. You don't drink again. And I said, hold on, hold on. I want to drink on weekends. He said, no, no. You don't drink on weekends. You don't drink at all. I said, well, I, I want to drink. He said, okay, you drink on weekends. And on the way, I remember I said to him, uh, have you stopped drinking? He said, yeah, I haven't had a drink for a week or something. And it was the Christmas season. I said, well, what did you do for Christmas? He said, I was out playing hockey with my son. I was going out with my wife. I was visiting my mother. I had a great Christmas. I said, Donnie, what did you do for fun? That's no fucking fun. He said, okay, Mike, never mind. I came home from the meeting. I lay in bed with all the literature. With my wife. I told her, I started reading the literature. I never saw anything like that. I said, uh, 
remember saying this. I said, I think I found some place that I don't have to drink. I said, this time I think I'm going to stop drinking. I don't know what she said. I was so relieved. I was so happy. I went to meetings and went to meetings. I lost the desire to drink for 11 months. Everyone was so happy, including me. I went on a business trip and I was told on the business trip, I had a sponsor, you go there, it's in Calgary and uh, you got this guy to phone, this guy to phone, you got meetings here, you got meetings there. I got on the plane. The guy I was traveling with, I think it was an Alki. He was ordering a drink before we even took off. I didn't take a drink. We got to Calgary and uh, we, I was with him for a week or two. I forgot about going to the meetings. At lunchtime, he had two or three drinks and I had a seven up. At night, he'd have two or three or more, many, many drinks. I'd have seven up. We were in bars. He kept saying to me at breakfast, and I'd look at him. He'd say, Mike, you used to drink, eh? I said, how do you know that? He said, because just the way you act in bars. You don't drink, eh? I said, no. That's all he said. Somewhere in the second, the second week, Out of nowhere, I got a compulsion to drink. Now I couldn't drink in front of him because I told him. I said, uh, you go back to Montreal. I got to stay here. I got some work to do. It's bullshit. That was my start of lying. He took off. He didn't care. He didn't know. He was half drunk half the time anyway. I got on my hands and knees in the hotel room and I said, God, please help me not to get in too much trouble. I've got a drink. I said, I promise when I get back to Montreal, I'm going to go back to AA. And no one's going to know I drank. I did that. And I continued doing that for 12 years. Getting down on my knees every four or five months. In that time, I, uh, I had to go to therapy. Came out of therapy. They liked me so much at where I worked, they made me the alcoholic counselor. Wonderful, Michael. You're going to therapy. You're not drinking. And we didn't even know you had a drinking problem. Isn't that wonderful what you're doing? They didn't know because I was just going on binges and I tried to protect myself from anyone knowing. And they made me the alcoholic counselor and they gave me 7,000 people there. The, the, my boss gave me uh, a lot of advice. I knew the president from school. And he was even thrilled that they had an alcoholic counselor, a nice guy like me. I don't know how long I went without drinking couple of months, I guess. Then I really had to hide my booze. I was the alcoholic counselor. 
I was told what people had problems in the company. And would I talk to them? Boy, that's torture. And I would go home to my wife and kids. She knew I was drinking. She knew I went out on a bender every few months. One day I wasn't at uh, work for a couple of days and the boss never thought anything. He phoned my wife and said, is Michael sick? Is Mike sick? I had to find him. She said, no, he's drunk. He's been drunk for a couple of days and I'm going to divorce him. Wow. In that period of time, I had sober moments. I didn't want to stay married. I had no love. As long as I had, was drinking, I would, that's what I turned out to be. I, I could stay married, but uh, I wanted my wife to divorce me. She did. I wanted the company to fire me. They did. I got what I wanted. I was able to drink. I didn't have to worry about his damn company as a counselor and my wife lying to her. And I was in some rotten place all alone, drinking, trying to make money and trying to do things. I went back to uh, therapy in uh, 1985, three weeks. And it was the 50-year uh, convention of AA in Montreal. And I attended that just out of therapy, and we were at the Olympic Stadium. 50 or 60,000 people were there. I think Bill Wilson's wife was there. And they announced, uh, Le Congrès est fini. The Congress is fini. Finished. 50 or 60,000 people just sat there. We had nowhere to go. I started crying. Where the hell am I going to go this time? I got no wife. I got no job. I just got to go back to drink. I took a trip to Fort Lauderdale. I suppose to uh, a few weeks later and I suppose that was to start another slip. And I was walking around the pool for a day or two or three. I felt out of place. I was all alone. Can you imagine? Of course, I got a compulsion to drink. Who wouldn't if you're alky in that condition, the condition I was in? I went up to the room and I got on my knees again. Please, God, help me not to get in trouble this time. I will get back to AA. I got a message. It said, this time, you're not getting back to AA. This time, you're not. I said, what am I going to do? I was talking to someone who wasn't there. And I got a message. It was, uh, get in your car, go for a drive, drive around, come back to your room, and you're not going to drink. I did that. I got in my car. I drove around. They started playing this 
I had the radio on. They started playing, uh, I Want to Know Where Love Is by the foreigners. Changed it. I didn't want to hear that. I changed the station. It was on the goddamn station. It was everywhere. I want to know where love is. I go back in the room. The desire to drink is gone. Hasn't come back. I went down to the swimming pool. I went down to the ocean. I walked up to the guy in the bar and I said, I want a orange juice. Because I said that before, I thought he ignored me. He didn't want to serve me orange. Who the hell wants orange juice? I said, I'm going to be here for a while. I had a staying for a week or two, and I'm going to have lots of orange juice. And I said, I don't know why I said this. I said, I used to drink, but I don't drink anymore. Just give me orange juice. I couldn't believe it. He said, yeah, sure, I know what you're going through. Just come in here and I'll hand you an orange juice. Miracles happen around me. They come from God. I eventually uh, remarried. I was given a daughter... 13 years, a lady from the, from the Philippines. I was not a spiritual person, but I wasn't drinking. This woman I met in the Philippines, and we started getting on together, and we got married, and she came after a lot of paperwork and probably miracles that she's here. She came here in 2017. She came without her daughter. Her daughter didn't, probably wasn't. We didn't think we could do it. I got here. She was here a year without her daughter. I was reminded by one and all what a rotten son of a gun you are, separating a woman from her daughter. I said, well, we'll try and get her here. We'll try and get her here. We filled out a bunch of papers. I was the last one that should be approved to be a, a stepfather. Within a year, she was my wife was sitting on the on the side of the bed and I walked in and she said it's it's approved she's coming again I cried she came here seven six years ago I guess she couldn't speak French it's French area here when she was in the Philippines, that little girl, she didn't have a father, a mother, a sister, a brother. She used to say, well, my mother's going to come for me. The kids used to say, no, 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 they're laughing. That's what kids do. Eh? She arrived here. She was as scared as a chicken. She hardly knew me. I had no patience. I was a, still a rotten bastard. I changed. I changed. I'll just say this, that uh, I forget to get this sometime. What I found. Somewhere in the papers. I stumbled over this. I think it might have been left with someone. Who knows who. I think it's from my stepdaughter. Walk with me, Daddy. Walk alongside me, Daddy, and hold my little hand. 
I have so many things to learn that I don't yet understand. Teach me things to keep me safe from dangers every day. Show me how to do my best at home, at school, at play. Every child needs a gentle hand to guide them as they grow. So walk alongside me, Daddy. We have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. I love you. God bless you.